Hi, welcome everybody. This is Artist Talk on Art. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of the organization. This is our 33rd virtual open studio, and we do have a special presentation tonight. We have YIVO, uh, Institute for Jewish Research. Um, I want to point out, last week, we had Elisa Pritzka talk about the self Nam people, a tribe in South America. And we never really planned linking anything together here, but there was definitely a link. Those people have been almost totally killed off by what has happened to their culture and to originally from Spanish people um, who came over and other peoples who sort of took them out of their culture in a way. And you know, when I think of YIVO and I think of your archive of four million objects, I realize you're saving history and how important that is. And whether it's a tribe in South America that this artist who I assume was in Brooklyn, but let's say New York, is somehow keeping them alive. There is a trend, there's a trend, you know, there was, I once heard a history about one coin, that was all that was left of a ruler of the Romans, just one object. And history does get lost and it's important for each generation to remember. And I think, you know, I'm going into a little bit generally about Evo, but you've done an amazing thing just to hear four million objects have been preserved. I do want to point out, you guys are at 15 West 16th Street. We usually hold our talks at 12 West 12th Street. Mm -hmm. So we are neighbors in that community. Artist Talk on Art has been around for 46 years. We've always been in the lower west side of New York City. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. All of our talks are free. We ask you to go to our website if you'd like to make a contribution. Thank you, it helps with everything we do. And I thank all the faces and all the artists that have helped us. I do want to say uh, tonight, uh, keep in mind, you can mute yourself if you ever want. We have a very unique presentation. Shelly Freeman will start us off. She's the chief curator of the online museum. Then Carolina Zukowski, Zukowski, who I have no problem pronouncing her name being a Kostrinsky. It's almost like Smith to me. She's the interactive designer. And then Olivia Reed, the research and project specialist, will speak. I do want to encourage dialogue and questions at any point. And often, it doesn't have to be questions. You can go ahead and make a statement. You can say anything you like. We like to keep this friendly and interactive. Yes, we will be doing screen sharing. There'll be a lot to digest. I think you're going to come away. This is a unique night. Usually, we have artists speaking. And I was sort of confused whether this fits in with our program. But then when I looked at what made up the culture of Vilno, did I get that right? Vilno, the town and the area, what makes it up is it could be a poster for a theatrical performance. It could be a play. It could be a design that was done. And of course, seeing the old photographs, they right away become historic and, and of course, they're, all, they're artworks in themselves. So I think the artists that are here, you're gonna be treated to something unique um, that is more historical, but of course in all cultures, there is that artistic side and it's sort of integrated in. So without further ado, um, I wanna welcome you all again and thank you for coming. Artist Talk on Art is about artists coming together and people coming together. I like to refer to us as a beehive, but from our last talk, I think the word tribe, and certainly that makes sense with the history of the Jewish culture. We create our own tribes, just the way Wendy described. She got together with friends on a holiday, and she's over 30 years. She's put together our, her own micro tribe. So Shelly, welcome. I'll have you go in. Um, I've set it up so you can screen share. I'll let you, of course, give more detailed introduction, and then actually go ahead and introduce the rest of the speakers. So. I do want to thank Shelley for making this happen. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Hi, everyone. As Barry said, my name is Shelley Freeman, and I'm actually, unfortunately, not the chief curator, but I am another chief. I'm the chief of staff at YIVO, and um, 
it's a pleasure to be with you all and delighted to have Sam Norwich here, um, who knows all about YIVO in a very intimate way. So just very briefly, I, I don't wanna sort of take up too much time because I wanna hand over to Carolina, who is the chief curator. So YIVO, as Barry mentioned, um, it began in 1925 in Vilna, Poland, now what's known as now is Vilnius, Lithuania. And I'd say it would, I would, it's like the world repository of Eastern European Jewish history. It was started in 1925 by intellectuals and scholars that wanted to capture, document, preserve, study Jewish life in all its forms. And um, just one little anecdote, um, or before, and it has actually an archive of over 23 million, not 4 million, like 23 million original artifacts, documents, things from the day to day of Jewish life, Jewish life, Eastern European Jewish life around the world to such, such precious things. I don't know if anyone's heard of the Vilna Gaon, he was the most famous rabbi at the time in Vilna, to the, to the Pincus, the record book of his synagogue. <laughs> Um, diary, one of the original diaries of Theodor Herzl. We also have within our collection the largest, the largest um, collection of original primary source Holocaust material. We have seven million, um, which is the largest in the world outside Yad Vashem in Israel. And just to see, I mean, just to sort of give you an idea of how far reaching, because Part of what Yibo did amongst many things was they set out these Zalmas, which were these collectors all around the world that collected, as I said, the day-to-dayness of Jewish life, Eastern European Jewish life. And as, I, as Barry meant, well, as I mentioned earlier, I come from Australia. And as I was going through the archive, I came across a poster for a Yiddish theater show, a poster of a Yiddish theater production in, in the 1930s, would you believe, in Melbourne, Australia. Polish Jews had made their way to Melbourne at that time and they were already starting to bring their culture there. And, you know, one of the directors I saw was A. Mushin. One of my good friends is Pip Mushin and I contact him and I said, is this any relation? He said, yes, that's my, my grandfather. So just to give you a bit of an idea, and I think one of the oldest things we have that I'm aware of, and Sam, you may be able to correct, correct me, was a was from the, oh no, no, sorry, we obviously have a lot of books and stuff, but there's this receipt dated back to the 1400s of a Spanish Jewish merchant giving a receipt. And it's, yeah. Anyway, you could spend years in our archive. But what we're here to talk about, at, what we're here to talk about today, and I should also just say we have a library of over 400,000 rare and Yiddish books as well as the archive. So, but what we're here to talk about is a new project that was launched by YIVO in August this year. But the idea for it, I think, came about three years ago. YIVO has, had, YIVO has is quite known for the YIVO online, YIVO encyclopedia, which is a very well resourced, very much, you know, probably more on the academic side. And there was this idea to have an online museum in which we could tell a story about these incredible artifacts in our archive. We could contextualize them and tell a story. And the idea was we would choose, we would have different exhibitions, which I suppose if you were going to a, a bricks and mortar museum, you'd have different galleries. We would have different exhibitions and each exhibition would focus on one person's life and tell their individual personal story. But through that story, the audience would learn the macro history of the time as well. And our first exhibition, which, is, which we're going to take you through and talk about, is the story of a little girl called Bebe Epstein. Bebe Epstein lived in Vilna, in, in pre-war Vilna. And she wrote an autobiography in the 1930s as part of a school project which talks about her family and so on and, and so forth. And basically the online muse museum, the first exhibition traces her journey from pre-war Vilna to the Holocaust, to after the Holocaust, and then her life in post-war America. And the exhibition draws on over 200 
artifacts from our museum, from, from, the, from the archive and brings together a story as, about these separate artifacts. And this is something Carolina will go into. But um, just something else I want to say. So Beber's schools archive, Beber's schools archive became part of Yibo's archive. And just to give you a, a really short overview, so Beber wrote this uh, this autobiography in the 1930s. It ended up being buried underground with a lot of other Yibo material during the war, and through a whole lot of uncovered, reburied by anyway through a whole lot of circumstances, which I won't go into, but is very fascinating. It was uncovered in 2017, along with a, with a whole range of about, I think 170,000 other YIVO documents. It was, it was found in, in Vilnius, Lithuania. And there was actually a New York Times article about this YIVO discovery in 2017, which also included like manuscripts from Sholem Alechem and a whole range of other things. But I think the journalists liked the fact that this autobiography had a picture of Deborah on it, had a photo of this 11 year old girl. And um, so they put that on the front cover and everyone of the, of the, of the article and everyone at Yivo had just assumed she was murdered. She was murdered during the war. Anyway, the day after that article was published, um, Jonathan Brent, who is the current executive director of Yivo got a phone call from her son in Los Angeles to say, you know what, that's my mum. And um, she survived. I mean, she had since passed on. She passed away in 2012. She survived. And she was the only member of her family to have survived. And it was quite incredible. And it was, it's an incredible journey for them as well, because they never knew that their mother wrote an autobiography and they're learning a whole lot more about her life. So it's been quite incredible. But as um, Carolina will take you through, the reason her autobiography was particularly chosen for this exhibition, because it really... She's just a regular girl. That's what's seen. I mean, the first movie she went to was Uncle Tom's Cabin in Vilna. You know, she was a fussy eater. She didn't like eating. And she talked about the fact that her parents would tell her scary stories. So she'd open her mouth in, in shock and then they'd quickly put a mouthful of food in it. She had aspirations to study, but she didn't kind of know what would happen. She knew about what the Germans, would, that the Germans were coming and how would that impact her ability to go to university. And this exhibition has been designed for Jewish, it's designed for everyone and it's multi-layered and, but in particular, we've done it for school children. There's a teacher's resource and so on and Jewish and non-Jewish children alike. It's been used at a non-Jewish school, for example, in London and a Jewish school in Melbourne, Australia, you know, so in this digital age, we feel we can have a real impact. And I know that you guys have a very strong art focus and Caroline is gonna sort of take you through that. I will rejoin you to talk about two artifacts that we have in the in the exhibition that are really precious to my heart. But at this point, I'm going to hand over to the chief curator, who is um, incredibly talented, and as you as you'll see from from what she has created. So over to you. Thank you, Shelley, and um, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Barry, for the invitation. Um, and before we dive into the exhibition, I want to talk a little bit about my background because it's relevant to what I'm going to be showing to you. So I'm a new media artist and designer, and um, I've worked both for museums, developing interactive installations and uh, developing my own work as well. And I've shown my pieces in several venues, including the New Museum, Spring Break Art Show, Art Center Hong Kong, the Museum of Image and Sound in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And um, I've won some awards too. Um, I've been an honoree at the Webby Awards, among others. And um, I've also taught at the Visual Arts Program at Rutgers University. Uh, so the point is, I see the museum as an artistic expression in itself. A lot of contemporary um, works of art focus on issues of social justice, community building, um, educational initiatives. So for me, the lines between art pieces and uh, projects such as this exhibition have been very blurry in recent years. And there was always an artistic intention behind it and a lot of interpretation and transformation of primary documents into the final exhibition. 
Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, first, I'd like to go over a little bit of the concept of the, the exhibition before we dive into specific artifacts that we um, have selected. Let me share my screen here. Um, actually, sorry, let me just do this. All right, here we go. So I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to go over this um, already, but um, in case you didn't, I'm just gonna go over the main um, concept of the exhibition. Um, so what we worked towards here, and this is something that Shelley has hinted about, was always to make the connection between her life and the historical context around her and how they influenced and had very real consequences in her life. So we are using her micro perspective to teach about micro subjects and we use storytelling as the main tool to achieve this. Um, so the storyline of the exhibition is divided into chapters. So this is chapter one and each chapter fo focus on a specific topic. So you can follow the whole story from beginning to end or explore individual chapters. All chapters are full stories in themselves and make sense as standalone pieces. Uh, so here we have a table of contents that shows everything that we have um, in the exhibition. So we show her life before, during, and after the Holocaust. Um, European Jews lived in a very rich society. As you can see in these first six chapters, they all focus on her life before the war. So we talk about her summer holidays, summer camps, what she learned at school, the city she lived in, etc. And at the same time, her Holocaust experience shows a diversity of experiences. So she hides with a family outside the ghetto, lives in the ghetto, works in a factory that used the labor of Jewish prisoners, goes through several concentration camps, and ends the war at Stutthof. And uh, she went through this by herself without any saviors. And each chapter contains several layers of information that enable you to explore the content in greater depth. So now I'm gonna um, go through one of the chapters. So this is chapter eight, her, her experience during the war, um, where Beba presents her, um, her account of the Holocaust. Uh, so the structure of the main uh, part of each chapter is Beba's story as told by her. And uh, on the left side here, we always have a timeline that shows the main historical events that were happening at the time to tie her story into the bigger historical context. And ensuring that the, the exhibition is set in this broader context, as I said before, is the core of this project. Then we have these um, historical context boxes here, and this is what we are calling them, which offer further information about uh, whatever it is that Beba is talking about in that specific moment uh, with a little bit more detail. So her testimony is a segue to learn about broader issues. So in this here, uh, this chapter is divided into three parts. This is part three, where she's taken into concentration camps. And she's talking about when they were being, uh, the Vilma ghetto had been liquidated and they were walking them out um, on the streets. And she could remember that um, everyone was lined up outside, but everyone was too ashamed to even look at them. But some people were standing and cheering on the Germans. And those are the ones that she said she would never forget, yelling things like, good for you, Jews, wind up on the bottom, go all you deserve. So then, for example, in this moment, we use this as an opportunity to talk about perpetrators, collaborators, um, victims, bystanders, and rescuers in a general perspective. And these here are photos of Jews being assembled by Lithu Lithuanian militiamen for execution. These are from our archives, too. Um, and uh, from here, we also connect whenever possible to um, other resources that we have uh, from EVO, like the EVO Encyclopedia, for example. So whenever there is an opportunity, we connect to the um, to, um, articles in the encyclopedia. So if you are interested in a specific subject, then you can go deeper into it um, using uh, these articles. So the idea is of this structure is to mimic the rabbit hole that we have all fallen into online, um, of going deeper and deeper and deeper into a subject. But here we make sure that everything is coming from trusted sources. And then finally, we have a whole selection of artifacts. So each chapter, as I said, there is a topic. And then we made a selection of around 30 artifacts for each chapter, 
where we go into our archives, expanding into that main topic, and we made a selection. So in here, this um, being the chapter about World War II, obviously we made a whole selection of um, artifacts from our archives that relate to the Holocaust in general. So we have um, some pieces, Charles is gonna get into detail into a couple of them later, but we have, for example, Nazi uniforms, concentration camp uniforms, a logbook from Auschwitz, um, this is a um, anti-Nazi propaganda. So there are several examples in here. And we also have a selection of maps to situate where you were um, at that moment. And this is especially important in this exhibition because there were many border changes. So we cover a period that goes from the mid 1800s until um, after, until current times. And there were several border changes, especially in this region. So the maps are important to show you where you were and what happened to the borders over time. Um, Oh, and I forgot to say, in every artifact selection, we always have a scholar text that expands into the topic of that specific chapter. Um, so then there is a lot of resources, as you can see here, and the idea is that users can explore the content of the exhibition at their own pace. Um, some chapters, they are more interactive, some more passive, like this one. Some are shorter, some longer, and each feature was chosen based on what would be the best way to showcase content while you're still keeping the audience, especially younger audiences, because we always had uh, the idea of this being used as a tool for education, um, engaged. So now I'm going to um, start by showing a little bit of pieces that were developed especially for the exhibition and they are more experiential in nature. So first, um, I wanna show you some of the pieces that we did for chapter five. So in this chapter, we um, are going through the city of Vilna as Beba knew it in the 1930s. So we recreated in 3D models some uh, sections of the city. So the idea is that you can look around, explore and use the arrows to uh, move. And we have several red dots where you can click and learn more about a specific people or places. So if you click here, this is uh, talking about the Russian library. This is one of the pictures from our archives and we explain what those places are. So the idea is to um, show a place that no longer exists. And um, Vilnius in itself wasn't a city that was destroyed in the war like many others, but um, all the Jewish buildings, they either were destroyed or they were repurposed and very few um, are still standing as Jewish institutions to this day. So it's, it's important to recreate the city that Baba knew. About a third of the population, of a third to half of the population of Vilna at the time was Jewish. And of those, um, a third to half were Orthodox Jews. So it's not only about the buildings that are not there, but also the people who are not on the streets anymore. And, um, the idea for this style, why we decided to go this way, is because um, there was a lot of places that we didn't know exactly how they looked like, so we didn't want to do a uh, photographic recreation, because some places we had to do uh, some guessing work. We had people in the streets uh, in Vilnius taking pictures for us of all the area that we were covering, but, um, and then we compared those and uh, with older pictures in our archives, which was a lot of the, all this work was done by Olivia essentially. And um, there were some places that there were some gaps and we had to fill those. So this is why we chose this style specifically so that you know that it's not necessarily a perfect reproduction. Uh, so then, as I said, you use the arrows, you can move around. And uh, I just wanna go into this other section here. So this is the section of Beba's uh, primary school. And we have a theater here. And as Charlie was saying, in this section, we talk about uh, the first movie that Beba saw on a movie theater, which was Uncle Tom's Cabin, an American movie. Uh, we recreated a poster in Yiddish and Polish here. And um, the importance of showing this is to show people that this was not an isolated community, that they had a lot of influences that came from other places. And they did not, a lot of people may have this idea that they lived isolated. That's not the case. They had several uh, influences. And if you see some of the books that were hits uh, with children in Yiddish at the time, you're gonna find um, Tom Sawyer, Robinson Crusoe, which are books that 
you know, a lot of kids around the world uh, read up to today. Um, and we have also adapted Beba's account into other experiences. In her autobiography, she uh, talks about her um, grandparents, both maternal and paternal, her parents and her siblings. And what we did here is we transformed her account into animation. So those are adapted. They are not a word by word reproduction. Sometimes they had to um, add some sentences to make sense and contextualize. And um, I am going to play one of those animations for you now. And uh, it should have sound. If there is no sound, please let me know. Meet my dad's parents, David Epstein and Chaya Kroina. My Zayda, by the way, that's grandpa in Yiddish, was born in Smorgon in 1854. It was a private town back then. He was a short man. I'm 11 years old and we're the same height. And we both have blue eyes. Zeta was a serious person who never smiled and hardly ever laughed. He was so religious he slept in a hat. He worked as a shipping clerk for 50 years. For many years, he was a leader of two important synagogues in Vilna, the Zavl and the Volks synagogues. He was a very knowledgeable man, a religious scholar who spoke many languages and studied the Talmud. My grandma is a Vilna native. She was born Chaya Krina in 1859, when Vilna was a part of the Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire. That was the only area Jews were allowed to live after they were falsely accused of stealing jobs and lying. I wonder if some group will always be blamed because they are different. My grandma was tall and thin. She was educated and knew almost the entire city. She worked as a storekeeper all her life. My grandma married Zeta, and they had six children. Both of them worked and Zeta was a scholar all his life. There is still no record of him laughing. All right, so uh, this is one of them. And then there were, um, we have other, four, other three, which are all very interesting, so you're free to check them out later. And um, she also discussed other things like, for example, her favorite activities during her summer holidays, which is something that it's extremely, extremely similar to that of many children today and even some adults. So she talks about loving swimming or yelling at the lady in the street who was selling things and also running on the street and make sure she's not run over by cars. So we transformed those into simple space bar games. So uh, you can play with little Baba. So this one is swimming. And I uh, just wanted to show you this one. And uh, another example of an experience that we did here it's her immigration process. Um, and um, her immigration process to the United States is developed as a game. And uh, just like an actual immigration attempt, you're going to be stuck unless you can find the right answers and answer things correctly. So it's a detective game. You have to find the clues in the main screen. And uh, once you're done and find the clues, you have to test your knowledge. And if you don't get things right, uh, just going to do this here. You're going to be forced to come back and try again. Um, and uh, in the end of this chapter, after you go through all of the um, questions, we talk about what it would be like if she tried to immigrate in 2020. And uh, long story short, uh, she would very likely not succeed and her life would have been completely different. She wouldn't be able to reunite with one of her last living family members who was living in New York City at the time. And this would also be true for many other countries, not just the United States. Um, so I encourage you to go through this, all of the chapters later. Um, each one of them, as I said, features a different experience and they are all very uh, interesting and engaging. Uh, so now we are gonna go over some specific artifacts. And uh, before we uh, dive into um, art related objects, I just wanted to show you her autobiography because this is the core of the exhibition and where we got the majority of the information about Beba's life and made the connection to so many other things in our archives. And we have the full um, um, autobiography available here. She has, she edited pictures um, of the people she had at the time, really herself, her parents and uh, her sister. And we have a full English translation to English as well. So now um, let me stop my screen share here and uh, let's hear from Olivia Reed, who is our research and project specialist. We'll talk about some special artifacts we have featured in the exhibition. 
Hi everyone, I'm Olivia Reed. As Carolina said, I'm the research and project specialist for the online museum. I've been at YIVO for about three and a half years now. I started working in education and programming before I moved into this project. So I'm just gonna share my screen and then I'll share just a few artifacts with you. Okay, great. So I've just chosen a few to highlight and I will move through them as I go. So this is a painting of Jakkover Street in, at the time, Vilna, Poland, now Vilnius, Lithuania. This painting was done by uh, Jacob Sir. Uh, Sir was a native to the city. Uh, Jakkover or Jakkover in Yiddish means butcher. So it is named Butcher Street because it was known for the large amount of kosher and non-kosher kosher butchers operating side by side, really highlighting how the Jewish and the non-Jewish community pretty much coexisted within Vilna at the time. It's also important, important to note here uh, the archways in this painting as uh, the Jewish quarter of Vilna was known for its picturesque archways. So this brings us to our next artifact that I'm highlighting. You might notice here that this is the same street. So I selected this photograph of the same street for comparison to the painting. Um, in this photo, you can also clearly see the famous archways that I mentioned. It was taken by the photographer Alter Kasizna, whose work is known for immortalizing Jewish life during the interwar period of the 1920s and 1930s. And Yibo, the Yivo archives hold a large amount of his photography. Uh, before the war, his archive of photographs was held in Warsaw um, and were destroyed during it. However, about 700 photographs from his collection had been sent to Yivo prior to the war, um, and they're now housed there. Here is another artifact here. So this is an illustration entitled At Home by the artist Bencia I have a question about the uh, archways. Sure. Are yeah. they functional or just decorative? Um, I believe they're mostly decorative. In the Jewish Quarter today, some of them don't exist anymore and the buildings are still standing as they were, but there are a few that are still um, effectively look the same as archways there. The, so you can't walk across, it's not a bridge. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's not a bridge. I guess it's more decorational, I would say or for decoration, yes. I'd like to point out how the photograph and the artwork are serving as historical documents. I know artists today who have gone to factories in Detroit and even in the South Bronx to capture what is passing quickly in our time. And you don't realize it when you're around it. I would imagine when they were around these streets, they may have thought this would be there forever, although Jews always seem to be persecuted and they've been a little more aware that it would be short lived. So sometimes it is just a photograph or a painting that becomes a document. It becomes almost, I don't want to say more than a work of art, but it becomes a richer and a thicker work of art. And you can see the realism in the photograph, um, but you get a different texture in that painting that maybe reveals something else, something about the light or you know, they all serve different functions and sort of tell the story of the space that's no longer there. I would imagine the archway is acting as a support as well for the buildings. That could be a functional element there. That's really interesting that uh, you point out how the photographs serve as kind of a historical document of the time because as Carolina hinted when she was uh, showing our 3D model, is that I spent a lot of time going through our old photograph collections of the streets in Vilna and comparing it to Google Maps to seeing if I could find where it was and if that building is still standing or what that building looks like now. Um, so there were some archways that I couldn't find anymore, but I could tell that they existed there because there was maybe a patch over in the building. So that was a really interesting experience to do that. And I felt, learned a lot about Vilna that way. It was a very good collection of photography at the Lithuanian State Archive in Vilna, uh, which we visited in uh, 2015. Uh, and there are, there are smaller archives of, of photography and records 
<clears throat> in other in other cities like Shavel or uh, Kovno as well. Interesting. Um, all right, so back to this artifact here. So as I was saying, it's an illustration entitled at home and it first appeared in the first issue of a literary journal called Young Vilna. Uh, Young Vilna uh, was a dynamic group of Yiddish writers, poets, and artists who were active in Vilna, Poland in the 1930s. Uh, they were celebrated by the city's intellectuals as an example of Jewish cultural renaissance and interwar Poland. They viewed themselves as rooted in Vilna uh, but also as members of the international avant-garde. And they also included here to go along with it, this is the cover of the same journal that the illustration at home was in. Um, and so this cover really demonstrates the juxtaposition of modernity and tradition uh, with modernity represented in the form of the smokestacks and modern industrialization and a tradition in the form of the archways found in the Jewish quarter of Vilna. So the archways are something that are very representative of Vilna of the time. Uh, during that era, when modernization was portrayed, certainly in France in the 1880s, uh, the train stations or the Eiffel Tower later on, it was looked on as a great thing. It wasn't like we often look at factories today and think of them as pollutants. It was seen as this is the future. This is what we can do. It was very, uh, it was a very positive attitude. Definitely yes. Uh, so I'm moving into. I've kind of divided these into sections. So this is the third and final section. So this is. So this will be a series of posters. Um, so. During the 1920s and the 1930s in interwar Poland, summer colonies and summer resorts were common destinations to escape urban city life. Uh, this Yiddish poster in particular is promoting the benefits of air, sun, and water as urban life and alienation from, neighbor, uh, alienation from nature were thought to be contributing factors in ill health and the spread of disease. Uh, this poster was created by the Berlin branch of OZE um, and distributed then across Eastern Europe. OZE, or the Society for the Protection of the Health of the Jews, was an organization across Europe dedicated to the promotion of health hygiene and childcare among Jews. Um, you'll also see this organization mentioned throughout Beba's um, exhibition, for example, OZE and TO, or TOES, TOZ, um, they uh, sponsored summer camps to take uh, children from poor urban areas out of the city and provide them with fresh air. And what does the writing say? How is it translated? Um, it's translated as air, sun, and water, I believe. Um, and then... I have a couple more examples that I thought were very timely of health posters um, relating <laughs> to right now. Um, so this is one of them. Um, it's on the importance of using preventative medicine and a healthy lifestyle to avoid and curb the spread of tuberculosis. So it reads, you can protect yourself from consumption or tuberculosis. To heal the sick is a great deed. Um, to prevent illness is greater still. And then, this one I found very relevant to today and not unlike signs that you see on the subway or any public spaces right now. Um, it's, an it's a poster on the importance of keeping good hygiene and it reads, before you've washed your hands and nails with soap and water, don't touch food, don't touch your eyes, contagious diseases stick to dirt. Um, so I thought that was a little fun to put in there for right now. Um, so that's just a few examples of the over 200 artifacts that are featured in Beba's exhibition. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Shelley. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing first. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Olivia. And where's Carolina? I'm gonna get Carolina to share it again. I just wanted to talk about two artifacts that um, I just think are so powerful. Um, so the first one, as I mentioned in my introduction, that Evo has the largest collection of primary source Holocaust 
material outside of Yad Vashem. So I think we have about 7 million or over 7 million um, different artifacts. So what we have here, I mean, you look at it and you just think it looks like a, a painting of a regular sort of civilian serious looking person. Actually, this is a painting of, and I never get, hold on, Carolina, don't scroll up just yet. I never get his name right, his pronunciation, so bear with me. His name is Arthur Sess Inquot. And who he was, he was the Austrian Nazi politician. He was a chancellor, actually, just two days prior to the annexation of Austria by the Nazis. And he was very, he became very involved with the Nazis and was a real, he also sent, got responsibilities over over Holland and was responsible for murdering lots of Dutch Jews and yeah he was a full-blown Nazi. So this is this is a portrait of him and I remember you know when I first started back in 2018 I was taken through the archives and shown various artifacts and this one always like put a chill down my my spine because when you turn that over and Carolina now if you can scroll up and maybe enlarge it it's actually a Torah scroll. So what had happened, what the Nazis were doing was taking our Torah scrolls and just, you know, cutting them up and putting them on wood and, and painting over it. Or, you know, I've seen other bits of Torah scroll that have made into shoe soles or just used to wrap things up. And I think what it shows is the complete, not only destruction of the people, but destruction of their culture and sort of everything they hold dear. So that was one artifact, and, and we don't know whether that, that was a Jewish artist that was forced to paint that picture or just a regular artist, I don't know, but I, I, I kind of find this very, very powerful, you know, to get your head around what, what this means. So that's the first artifact. The second one that I'm going to talk about is, um, we call it the, the Book of the Children, just as a short book, and what it was is that, um, the Lodge Ghetto was actually the second largest ghetto outside of the Warsaw Ghetto in Poland. And it was very well organized. I think it had something like 14 schools, perhaps. And I don't know, you know, if people know what the Judenrat is. They were sort of Jews that were appointed by the Nazis to run, to run the ghetto. And the head of the Lodge Ghetto was someone by the name of Rumkowski very controversial figure. I don't know if anyone remembers the speech he made about, you know, send me your children. Um, the Nazis said, none, the Nazis put a degree to decree saying to give them children 10 and under and the elderly 65 and over to be murdered to sort of save yourself. So anyway, I'm not going to go into that too much, but basically what happened was, you know, the the Jews realised how dependent they were on Rumkowski for their very being. And what they decided to do, maybe Carolyn, if you could do some of the, yeah. So what they decided to do was to give him a gift, a thank you gift on Rosh Hashanah. And what this was, it was it's a beautiful bound wooden book. And each page is like, there's a picture, like a drawing, different drawings. And, and it was, those drawings were done by various schools in the Lodge Ghetto. And behind the drawing would be a sig the signature from all the students of that school and the teachers. So there's a, again, I've been fortunate to see this. So you've got a page, which is a drawing. All, I don't know if we've got more different drawings, but each one, each page is a different drawing. And then underneath that, you've got all these signatures, handwritten signatures of the students and teachers. So that, 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 um, that book has, 14,000 signatures, 14,000 children's signatures. It was actually found in the Lodge Ghetto just after the war and then someone brought it to Yivo. Of those 14,000 signatures in that book, 200 survived. And um, all that's kind of left of them is, is those signatures which we still have. And I just wanted to very briefly say a personal sort of anecdote around that is that I went to New, or New Orleans um, last year for to visit and I was asked by a synagogue to talk to them about Evo and the work we do and so on. And one of the things I spoke about was, you know, we sort of call it the book of the children. And um, a couple came up to me afterwards and said, look, you know, we've done a lot of research and we know that our great aunt and her son were in the Lodge Ghetto and they went to school there. Anyway, I asked them to email me as much information as, we, as they could. 
And um, I sent it to our head of archives and she located the signature of this nephew who didn't survive. And um, I was able to email that to them. So anyway, those were two artifacts I wanted to talk about and I'm gonna hand you back to Carolina. Thank you, Shelley. And um, I just wanna go over a few more artifacts before we wrap up. Um, and um, we're talking about children here. And one of them, it's, um, we have this collection of toys. Uh, they are not original. They were done in the 1980s by Meyer Kirschenblatt. And uh, he made replicas of toys he remembered from his childhood in interwar Poland. And uh, Jewish children in small towns often made their own toys and passed on the craft from one generation to another. So this is a do-it-yourself slingshot, a replica of the toys he um, had when he was a child. And this one here is a do-it-yourself willow bark horn. Um, and children made horns like this in the springtime and called it a trumpet or a shofar, which is the ram's horn blowing the synagogues during the high holidays. Um, so these are two examples. We have others from this collection in our archives. Uh, we are also fortunate to have um, some collections of rare films. And uh, this one here, I'm gonna play it as I uh, talk about it to you. So this video was made by a um, tourist from the United States while he was visiting Poland with his family. Um, and he, uh, in this film, he found a family and he organized them going out from a house from the oldest to the youngest members of the family. And as they're coming out by the way they dress, you can see how the oldest members are more traditional and um, probably more religious. And as you get to the younger generations, they are already very much secular. And we use this video as um, an illustration to all the changes that were happening in Jewish society between the mid 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, this was the period that the Haskalah happened, the Jewish Enlightenment, and where, um, people moved from being very religious and conservative to uh, being more secular. So this is one uh, example of movies uh, that we have in our collections. Um, this one is one of my favorites. I'm actually gonna enlarge it. I don't know if I can enlarge it a little bit. It's not really working, but um, so this is a Yiddish map of the world from uh, the Yiddish uh, version of a geographic atlas. And uh, it was published in Vilna by the Central Yiddish School Organization. So this was um, a network of schools that were funded by um, socialist parties. Uh, and this is one of uh, the materials they used in the classroom. And um, so this here, and this is very interesting because it talks to um, everything that was uh, are going on today. So this is a political cartoon from 1924 here from New York. And um, so in the 1920s, there were uh, quotas that were put in place, uh, immigration quotas put in place by the um, uh, United States government with the goal of essentially stopping Jewish immigration to the United States. Uh, the quotas, they refer to a specific percentage of people that could enter the United States uh, given a specific um, census. So the first quota in 1921 referred to the 1890 census and only 3% of immigrants could come from the same amount of that population that was in the United States as of the census, uh, 1890 census. And then in 1924, there was a new quota put in place where only 2% uh, of new immigrants could come in, um, of immigrants that had come in uh, in the 1910 census. But the thing is that in 1910, most of the Jewish immigration had already happened. So that essentially stopped Jewish immigration to the United States. And this was in place up until after the war. New Jewish immigrants were only allowed in after the, um, after the end of the war with uh, quotas that were put in place specifically for refugees. So um, essentially the, we always talk when, and this is one of the things that was very important to us in this project. When you learn about the Holocaust, you learn, um, so much about the Nazi government, but we don't talk a lot about the role that other countries had in the Holocaust happening. And uh, the truth is that there was a conference, I don't know if you're aware, in 1938, there was the Evian conference that was called by the United States 
where they gathered um, more than 20 countries uh, and they were talking about the question of Jewish uh, immigration and Jewish refugees from Germany. And what happened in that conference is that everyone washed their hands and said, you know, we can't allow Jewish immigrants in. There's the Great Depression. We already have too many problems in place. And, um, and only the Dominican Republic of the countries that were in the conference were accepting refugees. And of the countries that were not participating in the, con in the Evian conference, China was another one that was accepting Jewish refugees. So essentially what it gave uh, the Nazis was the answer that they needed to say, okay, no one really cares about them, so we can move forward with our plans and there is gonna be very little repercussions. So this was the message that came out of this. And uh, this is something important that we try to uh, put through in the exhibition. So in this uh, specific cartoon from 1924, it was published in the New York Yiddish Satirical Weekly. I'm not gonna try to say in Yiddish, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it here, sorry I don't speak it, but the translation is the big stick. And um, Uncle Sam is sitting between good and evil and the good list reads, free immigration, tolerance, hospitality, American traditions, kind-heartedness, open-mindedness, idealism. And the evil read lists immigration ban, chauvinism, race, hatred, anti-Americanism, hard-heartedness, and uh, close-mindedness, egoism, cruelty, and despotism. And this is something that um, we are still seeing going on today in a very similar manner, although the main players might not be the same, but we still see this happening every day. And uh, just to end here with something um, that recently happened, the election. So this is a Yiddish flyer urging Jews to vote the Democratic ticket, which was Franklin Roosevelt for governor of New York and Herbert Lehman for lieutenant governor. Uh, so Roosevelt, as we all know, went on to become president of the United States in 33. Lehman became governor of New York and later a senator. And uh, here in the poster, they talk a little bit about their attributes, an able executive, child welfare, good, good citizen, friend of labor, power in the councils of state, human and prison reform, which are also things that are still very much discussed and needed nowadays. So, um, so you might stop my share here. <laughs> yeah, sure, you can ask whoever was asking. No, I wanted to go back to that, if you can go back to that. Yeah, absolutely, I can share my screen again. There you go. The uh, words up here. The, the words on top say a brilliant record. In, it's, a, it's English transliterated into Hebrew, into Yiddish mm -hmm. letters. Uh, and it says, uh, let us help Franklin uh, in his work. And what about this? Um, By the way, his name um, all yeah. Yiddish is written in Hebrew letters uh, yeah. always. It's not yeah. being yeah. translated into Hebrew. Yeah, okay. No, no, I'm saying that the, the uh, instead of like, instead of uh, saying, you know, a, what is it? A brilliant, a brilliant uh, of, record. That's English, but in Yiddish it would be, a glänzende record. A glänz, a glänzende Geschichte. So basically, it's Yinglish. Right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting too because it happens to every language, I guess. There is a lot of Spanglish going around in New York nowadays too. You see a lot of words, and uh, you hear a lot of words in Spanish that are originally in English, and then they become verbs in Spanish, and it would be no different with Yiddish too. Right. I do want to ask uh, Mr. Ugaretz a question. You Mr. were involved Norwich. as... Uh, Mr. Norwich. I'm sorry, can you pronounce Mr. that again? Norwich. My name is Sam Norwich. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Okay. Norwich. I, I kept my maiden name. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell us about your involvement, because obviously you were a critical player. We have Doug Shear with us, who was one of the founders from 46 years ago and still a participant at ATOA. Uh, tell us, Mr. Norwich, about your involvement and what you hope people to get from YIVO and what you've got from being a part of it for so many years. How much, time, a, do it's, it's How much a, time do you have? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think uh, my, uh, my involvement is really a genetic one. 
my my parents grew up in Lodge. Uh, they survived the Lodge ghetto. Uh, I was born in a DP camp in Germany in 47, and we came to the U.S. in 57. And um, uh, I trained actually to be a professor of sociology. And uh, uh, before I finished my dissertation, uh, I was asked if I wanted to be a candidate for the job of director of YIVO in, in uh, 1979. And long story short, I did that job for 12 years. Um, I, together with, with Bruce Sloven, after whom this archive is, is named, uh, this uh, uh, interactive museum project, uh, together with Bruce Sloven and Francesca Sloven and Marek Webb and David Fishman, um, we, uh, we were in Lithuania uh, at the end of Perestroika um, in 1989, and we were shown remnants of the Evo collections, uh, remnants that we thought had been destroyed either by the Nazis or by the communists. And there were articles in the New York Times and other newspapers about the discovery at that time. And um, in the three decades since, YIVO has managed to recover many of those collections, um, to digitize them, um, thanks to um, Edward, Ed, Edward, Ed Blank and uh, the staff of YIVO in the last few years. They've been digitized and they're now available um, for anyone anywhere in the world to access through interactive digital means like we've just witnessed. Um, this, I remember when this was a distant dream, when uh, librarians uh, at YIVO, Dina, Dina Abramovich, who was herself from Vilna, uh, Dr. Bella Weinberg, Yeltsulangi uh, Yo, uh, may she live uh, a long life. She's a professor of library science at St. John's. Uh, a from Jewish woman who uh, was instrumental in creating catalogs where there hadn't been catalogs before um, and making uh, 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 collection guides to these archives, which had been just papers, uh, random papers before. Um, and uh, we now know a great deal more about our history than we knew in 1980. Um, uh, even though we've lost many witnesses to the history, uh, people who actually lived the history, um, uh, Dina among them, Dina Abramovich among them. Uh, but uh, there, there is an enormous treasure house at the YIVO Institute uh, from which people today can continue to, to draw. Uh, it's, 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 it's a bottomless well. And um, uh, you know, people in New Orleans, people in Australia, people in Israel, people in New York uh, uh, keep coming back to this well and um, it, it, it really shows how the past has worked its way into the present. So um, uh, I, I continue to be committed to the work that YIVO does, even though I have not been director since 1992. Well said. I think Doug, uh, you wanted to make a point. Yeah, well, about six, seven years ago, um, I interviewed him, not remembering his name right now, so I apologize for that. But I, I interviewed uh, a PhD doctor who was the research head of a joint task force uh, of a number of countries, including the US, for the retrieval of stolen art. So it was about 
art, not only Jewish art, but just art generally, some of it coming from very large, um, from large collections that, that had been owned by Jewish people that were looted. Um, I'm just wondering, and, and I could add to this that although much of it was stolen by the Nazis uh, during the war, uh, most of it today is suspected to be uh, in, the, in the former Soviet Union, particularly in Russia. Uh, but that's a discussion for another time. What I'm curious about, though, is, and I've been to Evo a few times, um, how much of the Evo database, uh, physical collections, et cetera, are specific to art, either, either art objects, uh, objects of Judaica, or uh, records about the movement of stolen art, or, or you know, things that had been in synagogues, for example, or in private homes that were looted never again to be seen? That's my question. I, uh, I can't comment on the total amount of it, but we do have a small uh, art collection. Um, I guess it also depends on if we're thinking fine art or photography and, and so on. Um, but we also do uh, have a large arts and artifacts collection as well. Maybe Sam could comment on that a little bit more. Um, actually, I, I thought that Shelley could. Um, uh, I, I just want to add a historical footnote. Uh, Mark Chagall came to the 10th anniversary conference of YIVO in Vilna in 1935 and gave a speech, which we have, uh, urging YIVO to create a school and a museum of Jewish art. Uh, partly, I think, for budgetary reasons, uh, that didn't happen. It, I mean, it didn't happen in the next four years. And after that, it was just uh, impossible for YIVO to do it um, once the war had begun. Um, but uh, I mean, it's a miracle that YIVO itself survived. I actually, I actually do I have we're the number. Only, we're the only Jewish cultural organization to have survived World War II. Yeah. And, I have, done, I have done the numbers on your archives, and I was wrong at saying it was four million. I was only 19. no, it's twenty. It's tw what I, we have is twenty. The, the figures are twenty three million over twenty three million four hundred thousand books, and within that twenty three million, we have about seven million Holocaust primary source Holocaust material. So I was going to say I was I was only nineteen million off, <laughs> but I have done the numbers. All of your archives are art. What's happened is yeah. once objects take on historical weight, once they have captured time that has left, they become art. And as far as fine art or photography, it's a good thing Lawrence Wheaton has left the conversation. Otherwise, you know, he would point out photography is a fine art form. And the difference between fine art and regular art, the word fine really means nothing. The point is, um, Today, a lot of contemporary artists sometimes get to the point and say, should I just try and make you read a book? They almost become performance artists. Should I, I do my drawings because it's for a social cause. There are others of us who draw trees and it's enough to draw nature. With your work, what you've done is you've captured something that's almost a time capsule of the past and it has historic and if you look at the letters in some of those posters, the letters, they're not all the same font face. The letters in Judaism become art in themselves and the space around the letters, the negative space, even when you look at the Torah, you're supposed to try and see that, the sort of opposite side. Yes, obviously a lot of the artwork you show, the black and white was incredible graphics design, no question about it. And that's what we would normally identify with fine art. But I would say 100% of your archive is art. And yes, I lose the term, use the term loosely. But yeah, and Barry, just to add to that, you know, and Olivia shared the, um, the link to the, to the museum as well as the, the other project, the Vilna Collection project. But 
if you you know we really encourage everyone to get on and, and take a, take their own tour through the online museum and um, you know using the term art more loosely there's so much to explore I mean I'm just thinking as we were saying that we have the archive of many of the schools or at least Beba Epstein's school at YIVO and we have notebooks of all these students and some of the um, some of the pages of those notebooks are such intricate drawings that they've done or chemistry notes that they've taken and, and sort of copied scientific experiments. I mean, Carolina, how would you describe yeah, those notebooks? I, yeah, I, I'll share the screen and show some of the notebooks for you. But so um, these are children, probably around teenagers, like 12, 13. It's their it's yeah, their notebooks. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I just want to expand a little bit on what Barry was saying. In contemporary art, we have uh, the concept of art is just so expanded. Community organizing is art too. There is a lot of uh, things that people wouldn't ordinarily think it's art, but it actually it is, and it expands into all um, into all parts of life, really. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here to show you the notebooks that um, Shelley was talking about, and they are extremely interesting. Uh, those are all from our archives and uh, those are from several different schools. This one was a school in Osmiana, Poland. And um, this is a notebook that includes a detailed description of a chicken. And the right page here is titled How to Make Cheese. And those illustrations um, and the text are instructions of the kitchen processes using, in used in making cheese. Um, this page is a marking of a new section in this uh, notebook and the section's topic is about anatomy. So then here, this is an illustration of a skeleton and its corresponding bones. And I mean, this, this teenager really could draw because these are amazing, all the, all the drawings. And this here is a description of breathing mechanisms in living creatures such as windpipes, lungs, etc. And here on the right page, it's a detailed instruction of skin layers. Uh, so this is one example. We have several other notebooks. This one is from um, the archives of a Zionist school network. So their main language of instruction was Hebrew, not Yiddish, like the one we just saw. So this here are calculations from a physics notebooks, uh, notebook and the student measures uh, with and diagrams instruments such as a metronome, caliper, a microno micrometer screw. Um, and this here are properties of molecules and the forces of attraction that bring them together. Um, so you can see this is not only about uh, what they're putting in here, but this is a small window into their world. You can learn more about what did they learn in schools at the time? What was the curriculum? And uh, you can get a more of a, an idea of what happened in their worlds at the time. And the sad thing is most of these students probably were murdered. Yeah, probably. Yeah, there is a very, uh, one of the notebooks, uh, there, I don't know if it's this one, no. There is a very sad one, which um, it's, um, no, not this one either. So it's got to be this one. Um, and we have here a selection of uh, essays that the students wrote, but this was written right at the cusp of the war. So then the accounts of, um, are of children talking about what they wanted to be, but they are very aware of what's going on and that her dreams seemed very unattainable at the time. So this student brain, Gelfer, writes that what she really wants is to continue her education in high school and to become an actress. But she's 90% certain that as the daughter of a poor family, she's headed for an apprenticeship as a seamstress or a different trade. Um, Dope Kluger writes that because the world is so turbulent, she can't project a year into the future. But uh, she hopes she does not have to go through what children in Warsaw had to endure. And then this uh, bears a little bit of, um, of context. So they were in... Um, the eastern part of Poland was occupied by the Soviet Union following the Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, Pact. And uh, the western part of Poland was uh, occupied by Germany. In the eastern part of Poland wasn't um, destroyed right away like it happened when the Germans invaded. And there were many refugees that actually went from the western part of Poland to the eastern part where the Soviets were. Because at that point, it seemed to them that things would be all right, that uh, Germany wouldn't get into there, so they went on with their lives. And this is why she's talking about how 
Um, she hopes that she didn't have to go through what children in Warsaw had to endure. She hoped that things would be all right. And they didn't have much to do except to go on with their lives and hope for the best, really. Um, and then um, she goes on saying if there is peace in a year, she expects to go on with her studies, but uh, she doesn't know in what language. And again, when the Soviets occupied the eastern part of Poland, especially in the Vilna area, um, so that area became again part of Lithuania right when the uh, when the Soviets occupied. So Vilna was renamed Vilnius. The official language was not Polish anymore. It turned into Lithuanian. So all of a sudden, all students had to study and learn in a new language. So this was all a very um, it all happened all of a sudden for all of them. And then she ends up writing whatever happens. She's sure that the sun will continue to shine for us children. And this is very heartbreaking because, you know, it's very likely that she perished in the war. And uh, Gold Aronson writes about how she wants to study nursing, but it depends on many things, including her financial circumstances and whether the world will still be at war. Um, so. I just remembered uh, from our, my wife and I, we're in Vilna uh, in 2015 and then 2019. But in 2015, we had a guide who took us to a museum, a Jewish museum, which had in it tons of art. There must have been at least 100 pieces of art in this museum. Um, some of it just landscapes, portraits, whatever, but some of it referential to the Jewish life in, in Vilna. Um, and I don't remember the name of the museum, but it's worth, you know, definitely worth visiting. The other thing I was going to mention is there's a book that I read a few years ago when I was particularly interested in the stolen art theme called The Lost Museum. The author is Hector Feliciano. It's a fantastic book. It focuses mainly on five Jewish families in France, their art collections and what happened to them. Uh, it's a masterful piece of writing that I recommend to anybody that's interested in the conjunction of art, Jewish life, and the Holocaust. Uh, and then finally, I'd be remiss if I don't give a shout out to Dovid Katz, one of the great protectors of, of the Yiddish language. And that's it for me. Thank you, Doug. I do want to point out some beautiful things have been said in the chats. Leah, Paula, Leah Poller has said it's beyond inspiring. Your work is seminal, of course, speaking about your institute. Um, Carolina Zukowski, thank you. We really appreciate it. Elaine Forrest, thanking you, Carolina, Olivia, and Shelley for your wonderful presentations. Very beautifully presented. Love the animations. And uh, Shelley Freeman, of course, saying thank you to everyone. Uh, Jill Gerr. Gerwitz, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Leah makes a point, a country that refuses to remember its history is condemned to repeat it. I think we often hear that, but I take it a little deeper. I think it's not a question of repeating. I think we're always living it. If you look at the themes you mentioned, they're all current today. I was at an exhibit at the uh, uh, Morgan Library, and it was about 15th century art and they brought up the word alien and how people didn't like people coming from other areas into their area. This, we do not evolve except over 100,000 years. And we all, our history is very localized in terms of time. And so every theme you're dealing with is current, as long as we're talking about sapiens that can speak and have opposable thumbs. Um, it's a sad truth. And I, I think I have to mention, you know, you, you brought up what happened with other countries and how they didn't speak up. And I don't give anybody a free pass for anything like that. But there was the famous Stanford experiment with uh, prison guards. And in that experiment, when you're given the opportunity, you very quickly not only take on the role of guard, but you become very evil and very inhuman. And I don't want to uh, absolve anybody who didn't stop the Holocaust. But I do understand we have a very odd nature of going along with and not standing up against for what's right. And your institute is certainly making us aware of what has happened 
and what still happens, all your references to immigration, to looking at new people, to it, it, these are all current themes. I do want to open up as well to any other thoughts. Before I do, I want to say, again, we're the ATOA, a 501c3. This has been a very unique presentation for us, but it definitely makes us a little thicker. It broadens our outlook on art, and it's definitely, I, I want to thank you all before I summarize. But I do want to uh, ask anybody with any questions, or even just to make a point, um, you can go ahead and just jump right in. Well, I just would like, to, this is Francine, I'd just like to say that I spent a month uh, at the Yiddish Institute in Vilnius in studying Yiddish in 2006. And so I really appreciated this filling in of all of the history that I didn't quite get a chance to find out while I was there. So it was, um, it was very wonderful. Thank you. Leah, let me unmute you. Before Leah unmutes, I want to point out, Susan mentioned that it, it's important to realize the struggle organizations have putting exhibitions online, and Evo is committed to doing this. I almost said, you know, this could be a video game, and sure enough, you did not try and get at the youth and make them learn through gaming, and I, I applaud you, and you're certainly embracing as we are right now on a Zoom talk, you're embracing the new technology as we have to. Leah, you had a thought? Yes, um, there's a very good YouTube called Shanghai Ghetto. Uh, it's wonderful archival images and it does give the information to understand why China was accepting Jews from Central Europe. Uh, at the time of, the, uh, of fascism, they took away the passports from the Jews and they were unable to travel to any other country. But Shanghai was an open uh, city. It was the one city in Asia that was passport free. And so they ended up opening their doors to Jews and actually sending boats to the south of France to collect the Jews that were escaping from Central Europe. Uh, it's, um, I visited the Shanghai ghetto. It's quite interesting as well if you ever get over there. Uh, on, on that point, can I just add that uh, the co-chair of the YIVO board, Irene Pletka, uh, is herself the descendant of Polish Jews who found refuge in Shanghai and later um, moved to Melbourne, and um, uh, she was raised in Melbourne, has lived in Jerusalem, in London, in, in New York, um, is uh, uh, about to leave for Melbourne, I think, tomorrow, and um, has been instrumental in YIVO's progress for the last decade or more. He, he, I second that. <laughs> Absolutely. Very nice. I, again, I, I want to thank uh, YIVO as an organization. Um, of course, you, Sam, being a participant for a long time, but Shelly, Carolina, and Olivia for what you've done and what you've brought to our group. Um, this is the ATOA. We're a 501c3. I, I can't thank you enough, but I, I will say this is the tip of the iceberg of work that has been done by what looks like hundreds of people. <laughs> and of course, all the artifacts, the 24 million, were created by millions of people. And so this is a small part, but sometimes we have to hang on to these things because every moment they make them present to us so we can share them. I wanna thank you all in, in our ATO way. I wanna clap for Shelly, Carolina, and Olivia. You know, that was, uh, that was really beautiful. That was a deep dive. Thank you so much. Um, and become a part of the ATOA. Join us for some of our other talks. I want to say a shout out to Roberta, one of our board members that's here. And of course, Mitch and Doug. Nice to see so many board members and so many of our regulars. And thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And check out the museum for yourselves. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. That was a fun change of scenery. That was different. Good night. It everybody. was very informative, very interesting. Thank, Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Good night, Eloisa. Good night.